Hello, and welcome to the Grand Teton Music Festival's Backstage Pass, your weekly invitation to gather, to be in the company of friends, to learn, and to connect with our entire GTMF musical community. Today is show four, and we have brought percussionists, the percussion, Yay. part of the percussion session. <laughs> So it ought to be a really fun show. My name is Eva Capaletti Chow. I'm a violinist in the DTMF Orchestra, and I have been coming for almost 20 years. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see all of you. My name is Jerry Ho. I'm the associate conductor for the Grand Teton Music Festival Orchestra, and I've been with the festival for four years. And with us today, handling all our techn technological needs and editing needs is Mike Richards. So, Today, show four, we have percussionists. I have been so excited, it's almost difficult for me to like stay slow because I've got some of my favorite people in the orchestra um, here to talk together today. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce, um, as I'm going around, uh, we'll start off with John Kinsey. He and Brian Prechtel are together in the same place and I'll let them explain that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just start off there. So I'm John Kinsey. I've been, this would have been, I believe, my 31st year with the festival. And it's so disappointing not to go, but it's also great to be doing this Zoom meeting with you all. And I'm in Denver with this guy. <laughs> I'm Brian Prechtel. This would have been my 29th season at the Grand Teton Music Festival. And strangely, I am in Denver also. I usually live in Ellicott City outside of Baltimore, I play in the Baltimore Symphony. But uh, my husband, Tad, uh, wanted to visit his uh, sick grandpa, who uh, is up in Fort Collins. So we came out for a little visit, and it's just great to see John and Karen and the whole crew. Next on my screen is Mike Crusoe. So Mike, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Mike Crusoe. I'm uh, one of the timpanists there at the uh, festival. And I've been at the festival for a little, it's a little over 10 years now. Uh, it doesn't seem that long, but it's, it's been about <laughs> <laughs> 10 or 11 years now since I've been there at the festival. And where are you during the year? Where are you now? Uh, I'm currently living in Las Vegas. I was a uh, tempest in Seattle uh, up until three years ago when I decided to retire and I moved here to Vegas, but I continued with the festival uh, to continue my playing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, the, we're the better for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Next on my screen is Richard Brown. Anybody who's in our audience today that knows anything about GTMF knows who Richard Brown is. But if you would introduce yourself, Richard. My name is Richard Brown. I'm talking to you from Houston, Texas, <laughs> as you can see behind me. That was a beautiful sunny day about four weeks ago. Uh, we've been having nothing but rain the last uh, three days. Uh, I've been probably involved with the festival at least the last 40 years. Uh, and uh, this seems like yesterday. And as John said, it's very sad that we will not be playing this summer, but we'll look forward to our uh, 60th anniversary year in 21. And last but not least, um, the most newbie of the group that's here, Matthew Strauss. <laughs> I have newbie. Heard. The newbie of DTMF. You call me newbie. That's going to be my new nickname. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> newbie. So, so yeah, I'm definitely a junior member. Um, I've, I've, this would have been my third, third season with the festival, and I'm, I'm very, very sad to not be making music in Wyoming this summer, uh, and with all, with all of you people. Um, I will say though, Mike, Mike, and I are there at different times, so it's actually nice to enjoy some time with, with Mike Crusoe. Thanks, and, man. Absolutely. And I uh, live in Houston, Texas, like Richard does. And I play, um, I play associate timpani and percussion in the, in the Houston Symphony. And I teach at Rice University. And I'm glad to be here hanging with everyone today. If there's anything I know about the percussion section, it's that they hang together. <laughs> Let so the hang. This is <laughs> I'm curious about a couple of things. So let's get kind of serious first before it all devolves um, into fun during this time. Um, what have you noticed that you didn't, that, that, like a loss that you didn't expect? And also, what have you noticed that's been a gain? I've, I've gotten to spend a lot of time with my family, and I've got a two-year-old and a, uh, 
a six-year-old, so it's a lot, and um, homeschooling and the whole bit. And my wife's a journalist, so she would be in locked in the bedroom doing all interviews and stuff like that because she's working <coughs> at home. So I was watching the kids eight plus hours a day, and as stressful and difficult as it has been, I have bonded a lot more with them, and I would never have had that opportunity. One thing I do miss, though, on the other hand, honestly, is just is playing. You know, um, you know, our schedules are all so busy with different things: teaching, playing, and families. And and uh, sometimes it's like, you know, oh my God, I got to do this, I got to do that. But now I actually want to play. I'll play anything. I'll, I'll shake a, a rock tambourine. You know, anything to play. So I am looking forward to doing that. Yeah. Jerry, I know I watched you smile as Matthew was talking about that. Is it Matt or Matthew? I don't know you well enough to know what you go. Uh, either one. Matt's fine. Matt. Yeah. I saw you newbie. smile, Jerry. Newbie. Newbie. Matt. Newbie. Newbie. Yeah, my name is Newbie. Newbie. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll all forget about that next summer. No, we won't. Jerry's been doing a very, very similar thing to, to Matt. Do you want to say anything around that before? Oh, sure. I mean, do you feel like you've hit your stride, Matt? I mean, I feel like the first the first month and a half was like just trying to figure it all out. And now Jerry has a three year old. Remy Remy and I are in our sort of we we sort of have our little routine together and I'm sure with Garrison and your daughter's name is Lily. That's right. Good and, memory. Uh, Garrison and Lily is like uh, you know, one plus one does not equal two. In the case of kids, it's like it was about five, right? <laughs> so yeah, <about> twenty-five. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's yeah, definitely. Some things have gotten easier, and some things have gotten more difficult. Uh, I'm sure anyone watching this who has kids, like young kids, uh, will understand varying degrees of complexities in in watching kids in, in a pandemic when you can't even take them to a store to, for a break because they're going to want to touch everything and. And, you know, it's needless to bring more people into a store. So you're doing a lot of biking and walking and on their scooters. And you don't even want to, you can't even go to the beach because there's, um, there's a bunch of knuckleheads, you know, there. And, and you, you got you to gotta be selective of where you can even take them. Matt said something that, that sparked something in, in my thought process. I, I, was, I was looking around our neighborhood uh, this, this week. And I'm just realizing, though, how many kids are out riding their bikes? How many families are walking together and, and spending time together? I just think the, one of the things we've gained is this incredible uh, uh, you know, amount of, of an opportunity to appreciate each other, to look outside and spend time with nature. We're just not in that, that, that rush of a time frame that I think we find ourselves in so much of the time. And uh, I, for me, the, the, the loss of the companionship of all my, my colleagues, that I, you know, have such close friendships with in the Baltimore Symphony, and of course, all of you guys. It it is so great to be here this weekend with John and Karen, and get a little taste of that. But you know, I'm lucky to have uh, my husband around and two of my kids around, so it's not like I'm living alone. That I think would be really hard. I've talked to some of my friends that are living alone. That's really hard for people, I think. When you ask, what do you feel a loss of? Uh, of course, the obvious you would say you feel a loss of the finances, the economics, not working. But I don't think that that's, to me, that's not as important as the loss of not playing. I mean, I've never gone, this is like, we're going on four months now. I did two viral, like viral recordings with my band. And I played the drums for like 10 minutes on each of those to record it. And that's the extent of the playing that I've done uh, in the last four months. So, you know, and, and the other thing that Brian said, your colleagues, I miss, I miss seeing my friends, the people that I see regularly at work, talking to. I don't know how it is with your orchestras, but the Houston Grand Opera has been having all kinds of social events, uh, happy hours, and I, things like that, just to keep people connected somehow. Uh, but anyway, the miss, what you miss, what I miss is playing music. I mean, I, I've never gone that long without ever playing music in my whole life. What did we do? Uh, you know, we filled the time. Actually, we started cooking. Susan and I are cooking a lot of our meals at home that we never did before. So we've got a, she's got a whole uh, cadre of recipes that we've been trying them and cooking together and doing it together. So that's something we've gained. Yeah, it almost is that slowed down, like 1950s feel, like you get the opportunity again to just. Yeah, in the 1950s, I was sitting in front of the TV watching Howdy Doody. <laughs> <laughs> 
What about for you, Mike? What is your experience? You know, for the most part, since uh, since retiring, playing full time, uh, it hasn't been a huge change for me in that uh, I've been pretty much a homebody uh, to be <laughs> to begin with. But uh, I I miss uh, uh, Charlotte and I. We would go to the gym three times a week. Uh, I miss doing that. Uh, I, I uh, of course I'm going to miss this summer. Uh, especially since tea time is pretty much my source of playing. Now, this will be the first time I would have gone an entire year without performing. And that's the thought of that is just, it's just weird, you know. Uh, uh, and I, I do miss my colleagues back in Seattle. I'm concerned about what everyone's going through, uh, you know, with this whole pandemic thing and seasons being canceled and uh, not knowing what the new normal is going to be, you know, when you're, re you're in the profession where you rely on, you know, big audiences and crowds, you know, where it's, it's hard to do social distancing, at least to the extent, you know, that uh, they're saying it's safe to do. But, you know, we're still enjoying life and we're adjusting as necessary. We're taking all the precautions, but I sure will be glad when this is behind us, I tell you, I really will. Uh, I mean, a while back, I was talking with uh, Jimmy uh, uh, Wyman in, in Baltimore, and, you know, and everything that they were going through. And that was before all this. So now, you know, this hits, and then I think they're in contract negotiations for. <laughs> yes. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I mean. I can tell you, yeah, tell you all about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, so I'm sure there's a lot of uncertainty there on top, you know, so it's it's hitting everybody hard, and I understand that some places worse than others. Uh, I'm I'm proud of the fact that they, uh, at least they've worked something out to uh, sustain themselves in the short run, in the sh uh, short run, but. Uh, Oh, we're going to be okay. I'm really concerned about Nashville, Indianapolis, places. I saw where Nashville seeing, canceled this. Yeah. yeah, terrible things happening there. Yeah. Really yeah. bad. And I think about my freelance colleagues too. You know, who rely on gigging. Uh, uh, they're they're feeling the impact as well. So uh, I understand. You know, it's it's everywhere. And I so because of that, I try not to be too down. Not being the tea time this summer, but. It, it's still, this is, you know, our, it's our passion, you know, when something comes along to negate that or offset that, it, it, it really gets to you. And what's occurring to me as you're all talking about that is because we're all in this crazy thing that nobody started, right? I mean, it's a pandemic. Right. Right. So we're all in some weird ways equals. I mean, the, the people in the administration are trying to figure it out. We musicians are trying to figure out who we are in this. And then we have no plan of what's the future going to be. So even if you're making 40 provisional plans, you don't know. And that's what's so tricky about this. Uh, John, I want to make sure we don't, we don't miss you in this loop. Uh, and I do also know that you've been on your own committee and stuff, too. So if you wanted to speak towards where we are, then... then um, I would welcome that. If not, then we can go back to kind of the original question and make sure you get your, your chance at it, which is, what are you doing during this time? What have you, what's your experience? Well, I think I pretty much agree with what everybody has said was, I really miss not playing in the orchestra and I miss not seeing my colleagues and friends. And it's hard not to go into work. The, the flip side of it is that we're home a lot. My wife and I are here a lot. We have, luckily our boys are older, they're both teenagers, so they're really self-sufficient. And sometimes we don't even know where they are in the house. Uh, and we, we've been doing a lot of walking. We decided it would be a good time to foster a puppy because we were gonna be home for the summer, but we failed at that and decided to adopt the dog, which is amazing. And usually we're gone about nine weeks every summer. So this is the first summer in 20 years that we'll be here at our house, which is really nice. We have a pool that we can swim in. We have a nice neighborhood that we get to walk around. Um, we've been doing some camping in Colorado and we have a couple more trips planned. So we're trying to make the best of our situation. And I'm also realizing that I'm not ready to, ready to retire. I mean, I'm 62. It's in, the, it's in the back of my mind of, you know, five or six more years. But by then, who knows, maybe I not, might not be ready because I'm not ready now. 
I'm so grateful we're musicians during this time. I don't know what people who don't have their instrument do, which brings me to my next question to all of you. Since if I'm a violinist, mine's right over there at all times, right? It's really easy, but you all have instruments all over the place. So what is the experience of a percussionist? Well, I have, I have instruments here at home that I'm able to practice on. Uh, Karen and I have done some marimba violin duet stuff that we did some video recordings for our church, which has all been online. So they've presented a couple of those. Uh, I take ukulele lessons, so I've been practicing ukulele, not as much as I wanted to, but that's easily right here at home. But the flip side of that is that I teach at the university, like, uh, like Matt teaches at Rice, I teach at the University of Denver. So all of my lessons have been on Zoom. Yeah. And the problem with that is that the students have not had access to instruments because the buildings have been closed. So uh, I think it's really tough for younger younger players <laughs> that don't have don't have the instruments at home. And luckily, I have things that I can still play. Here. Someone asked for the puppy, so the yeah. puppy's here. <laughs> uh, speaking of the younger musicians who don't have instruments at home. I'm one of those uh, younger musicians that don't have instruments at home anymore. Uh, I have the the, the, ex, the only access I have to Timpani now is at uh, at the festival. But the way that I keep myself short, so to speak, is I've got my malice and I've got a drum pad, and I do that to keep my hands loose. Uh, and beyond that. Uh, I think Jerry may be impressed with this. Uh, I take an approach when uh, preparing for the summer, the same as though I was going to be a conductor. I get a score, I get a recording, I study it, I learn who's doing what and why. I mean, no matter how many times I might have played a, a particular piece, uh, I just approach it as though I'm going to conduct it. This is the same approach I took as a student, which is a common problem for percussion students not having instruments at home, you have to rely on the school uh, right. to have access to instruments, to practice. And a lot of times, you've got to compete for that time with other students. You know, that's why I have sign-in sheets and so forth. So it's almost like I'm reverting back to my student days right. when it comes to practice and preparation, which is a good, good thing to have to fall back on. And I'm glad I, I was taught to take the approach of uh, performing as though I had to conduct whatever it is that I'm performing. I mean, it's now it's really paying off. What's the old joke about tuning when it comes to timpani is that half of timpani playing is tuning, and then the other half is playing out of tune. So, <laughs> kind of is now, so to speak. I thought that was harpist. I was going to say, that sounds like a harpist. Oh, harp harpist too? Oh, OK. That's Stravinsky There's a said yellow that. joke in there too, but I think on. Stravinsky actually said harpists spend half their time tuning and the other time playing out of tune. Really? Well, I wasn't aware of that. Wow. <laughs> that kind of makes me a genius, right? <laughs> I wanted just to interject real quick. We have some we have a lot of friends from the orchestra here and the audience watching, and they of course want to say hi and everything. Uh, we have Phil, we have Marsha Peck, who, who we will see in a couple of weeks, celebrating her 50th year with the Ooh. festival. Ooh. We have Joan, we have uh, Gail, who was on with us last week. We have Dave Williamson, we have Dan Resner. We have a lot of friends, uh, Amy Pickler. And also we have a special uh, guest who wants to join us actually right now, and that is Maestro Donald Runnicles. Oh. I'd like to uh, jump on and say hi to all of you. <laughs> Like a good orchestra, we all get quiet and pay. That's right. <laughs> We're waiting for the tuning note before we. Uh... Yeah. Hey. Hello, Maestro. Hey, you know, I, I feel conjured up. I, I feel the calling. Somebody, I think it was Mike, who started talking about the conducting mystique. And, yeah. uh, I don't know. I was somewhere else. I was doing something else, and all of a sudden, Woo! <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> Greetings to you all. You are loved and missed. I want you to stay on for just a moment, if you will, because what I would love to ask all of you, and maybe just a few words and we'll just go through, what will you miss, do you think, if we, if we could choose one or two things that we'll miss most about not getting to go to the Tetons? 
what would that be in just a word or two? The sound of that concert hall. Playing with these colleagues, these great, this great percussion section. Same. Playing with the colleagues, playing with the musicians that come out there in the orchestra. Uh, what? I, I, I'm going to miss Donna. I'm going to miss the orchestra. I'm going to miss the whole atmosphere. Uh, I, I'm going to miss the uh, uh, the guests that come through and play with us. I'm, I'm just going to miss it all. I really am. My thing is, uh, people talk about you know a seasoned orchestra and how they have to play together all the time, year year in year out, and then finally you get to that level. But that rule doesn't apply here because every time I come out, I'm, I'm like, what the heck just happened here? I mean, it sounds <laughs> like we've been playing. So I'm going to miss that. It's every time it, bl it blows my mind. About for you, Maestro. I think uh, I don't think I know what I I already miss the most is the the sound and the, the personality of the orchestra. Uh, the fact it's one of the world's great orchestras is beside the point. Uh, it's more what, what creates this remarkable alchemy. Uh, and it's something that of course, I think each and every one of us a little like Christmas or whatever holiday we, we, we celebrate and we count the days to it's only blah, blah, blah days till the Grand Theatre Music Festival. And I, I feel that all of us work with uh, great musicians and great orchestras in our hometowns. Uh, but, uh, and this is certainly, I didn't, I didn't invent this phrase, but uh, in the Tetons, everybody walks into that hall, they check their ego in at the door um, there is no hierarchy to speak of, and to a certain degree, it's almost ironic that because it's so egoless, where music and performing needs such a large ego, um, it's just within a few hours or a few days, um, this magic takes place. And we, we can call it alchemy, but I, I, I think it's, and, and so many of you attest to the, the fact that uh, whether some of your greatest friends were made in the Tetons or children were born in the Tetons or there is a connection to the festival, but a connection to the environment, to the ambience, to the spirituality, which infuses everything about this. And, and while you're doing it, uh, you, you pinch yourself and you say, I don't want this ever to end, but perhaps it's because it does after seven weeks ends and we all go back to our respective organizations and i just miss it like crazy and I, clearly I, I work with the very fine ensembles but there's no ensemble no group of musicians uh, in in the various configurations over the summer that for me come close to that's perhaps exaggerated i mean don't come close but there is something about the uh, our our festival and Frankly, if I may be so briefly immodest, just the bond that I have with you through thick and thin, uh, ups and downs, <laughs> we've been through a lot together. Yeah. And that, whether an audience knows it or not, hears it. It's uh, part of my life, it's part of who I am and what I take each year from the Tetons uh, profits the other organizations with which I work. Okay, you can applaud. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's what I missed the most. <laughs> applause. <laughs> that was very well said, Donald. Thank you. It was yes. beautiful. There's a question that came in from the audience that was asking everybody, what are they listening to to inspire themselves during this time? I've been making my daughter listen to like Hamilton and uh, you know a couple of things that I, she 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 poo poos any kind of show tunes she calls them. I'm like Hamilton is one of the greatest works of art of our time, and so I made her listen to that. And uh, you know Hades Town, a couple of you know I'm gay, so we listen to Broadway. What can I say? John, <laughs> what about you? Um, mostly, I'm listening to my kids' Spotify. They just run their phones through the speaker system and. And so it's a pretty eclectic mix. I'm spending too much time listening to CNN, unfortunately. Wow. When you want to inspire yourself, Richard, do you find that music is where you turn? 
right during this time? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, I usually play music on my computer, just different things when I'm working, mm -hmm. when I'm just working at the computer. I just slap on the R&B and I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, give us a title. Give us a name of one of your favorite songs. I kind of want to hear it in my own head. Uh, well, I, I like, uh, you know, one of my all-time favorite R&B tunes is uh, uh, a tune called Ball of Confusion by uh, The Temptations because mm. to me, if, if you listen to the lyrics of that song, a lot of what they're saying, it applies today, even though the record came out in like 1970. Uh, so it, it's just pretty amazing. So that's that's, uh, cool. that's probably one of my just all-time favorite R&B tunes, but I have a lot of them. Did you play drum set as a kid, Mike? Yeah, I started out as drum set. Uh, as a matter of fact, I thought I was gonna be a big time drum set player, you know, it solved the show, all that business. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think we I, all did. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. And uh, when I started wow. studying uh, classical percussion, uh, my drum set playing just went right out the window. I, I was the same thing. I started out playing drum set, then I got into classical playing. And in fact, my drums were in the corner for years. I, I always said, I moved, when I moved to New York, I moved my drums from Houston to New York, then I moved to Brooklyn. I never took them out of the case. I moved them to New York, to Brooklyn, back to Houston. They sat in the garage. And only when I started doing this band, I took my drums out of the garage and started playing. But once, once I got into orchestra playing, I hardly ever played my drums. Matt, what are you listening to when, with your kids or whatever when you need to uh, get inspired? Well, talking about inspiration, I've thought a lot about uh, my students at, at Rice and what they might be thinking, like, <laughs> what's going on? All these, um, all these orchestras are, are temporarily closing up shop. And, and so my job, part of my job is to keep them motivated because this is going to be temporary. <laughs> it's going to pass at some, so, at some point. Um, so I'm actually uh, encouraging them to uh, listen to pieces, uh, Sibelius, Fifth Symphony, and I'm giving them assignments to listen, and, we, and then we talk about the piece afterwards, and not just the timpani and percussion parts, but we literally talk about it. So because of that, I'm actually listening to a lot of classical music, and, and I think about what I want to tell them about it. I'm thinking about things like, the, the part in Shostakovich Fifth Symphony in the first movement, there's this awesome part where it's building, it's building, and all of a sudden it's this militant martial type part with the snare drum and the timpani, jun, jaga, jun, jaga, jun. And, and I'm trying to pump them up. And it's very easy because I'm actually getting pumped up about it as I'm listening to this music. Like, oh, uh, that's why I went to this. So it seems to be working. They're digging on that. Uh, so I've also been showing all these pieces to my daughter and son. They're two and six, and they love it. Like <laughs> Bartok and Shostakovich and even like uh, Ligeti, like everything. And they're like totally into it. And, and then also I'm branching out into Led Zeppelin and, and, and Ruben Blades, which is like uh, Latin salsa music. And <laughs> just trying to do a whole bunch of things. So. What about you, Donald? I find that leading a very busy life, the one thing I really hardly ever get around to doing <clears throat> is listening uh, to the recordings of, I, I mean, I really have gone back and got, gone back into the archives. Uh, one of the works I, I, I took the time to learn, finally, uh, because I had this uh, imposed sabbatical was Mahler said. <laughs> I've never, ever <clears throat> conducted and I've never really, really learned it because I've always felt a barrier between me and it. And so I've had all this time to, with two st scores and you know, anybody who's, you sometimes get the question, do you listen to recordings, Meister? No, no, no. Uh, just the purity of doing it yourself. Of course I listen to recordings. Everybody listens to recordings. And now through Spotify and uh, through just all social media and joining the Gustav Mahler Society and the Anton Bruckner Society and gosh, there are weirdos out there. <laughs> um, but it gives you the chance to uh, listen and, and just listen to the history of a work or the performance of a work. And that's something that I have to say that if I hadn't had this amount of time on my hands where I could, where I knew that I didn't have to work, I didn't have to work specifically on the work that I had to learn there and then, I've had a ball 
listening to great recordings of great artists and and anybody who says uh you know once again the maxim that oh well you will you, you can never recreate what somebody else has done well it's not so much recreating uh, what somebody has done it it inspires you to do or try something or you have new insights into something which in turn um gives you a deeper insight into a work um I, I just find that all very therapeutic but that 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 has been a revelation if you like for me over these months is i have just finally gotten around to listening to all these unbelievable recordings that are out there and uh, i feel edified and nurtured that's absolutely beautifully put now i always think about listening to other recordings from um from the past it's always uh, you know for us listening to a specific conductor it's always like um it's like having a lesson with somebody and those that are not around anymore it's a chance to see how they would think about a piece whether it's someone like foot wangler or some some from the golden era but um yeah it's 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 amazing to time to listen to a lot of different music we have a couple of questions from our audience uh, one is from Gail Williams for you, Donald, uh, and he wanted, and she would like to know maybe Mahler seventh in the future. <laughs> you know, much love, Gail, out there in the ether. Um, I, I thought, oh God, the moment I say this, somebody's going to say, "Well, why are we not doing that?" We will, we will. I, I have to say, uh, as I, as I say, having worked in it now and analyzed it and listened to various recordings. I feel edified, I feel enriched, and yeah, let's do it. And uh, if, I, if I may ask one more question from our audience, uh, from Daniela, and she would like to know what advice you would give to students finishing up graduate degrees in music at this time. What can they do to, to stay positive, uh, to keep on working towards uh, any, any words that you are giving to your own students? Kind of partially what I was talking about earlier for one, Think about things that keep you motivated, uh, whether that is listening to great recordings or watching videos of, of orchestral recordings or, or not. It could be Bach, it could be Hamilton, like Brian was saying. Anything that floats your boat that gets you uh, inspired and pumped up. Um, also, you, time management's everything. So at this part of your life, you're not gigging. No one's gigging, we're not. Uh, you're not trying to hustle to get gigs. You're not taking additions because they're not having additions. That's all going to happen. And when that opens up and when that happens, you're going to be the one to be the most competitive or the one who's most ready to play because you're going to be the one that's going to have – you're doing, setting yourself up for greatness by uh, practicing now and having a regimented practice from routine and studying the music and loving the music. So that's your job right now. Is you, it's a gift. It's a gift you have all this time. And if you use it wisely, uh, you're, you're going to benefit. Because a lot of other people, they're going to be distracted by the silence. And they're going to falter. They'll be discouraged. They'll be depressed. All those things. Don't allow that to happen to yourself. Well said, Matt. Yeah, next up. Also, it's really important that we observe what's happened during this time. I think that inventiveness has really been rewarded. And I think the people that have been inventive, people who uh, realized, okay, I better get my technique, technical game together. I better learn how to tape myself. I better get, get my record, recording equipment together. And I better be flexible and know that creating a career these days in the environment we're in is, is about rewarding your flexibility, your, your ability to look at your gifts and find different ways to, to put those gifts uh, into action because it's it may the path you take may not be the one you sketched out for yourself because look at the unpredictability of this moment we're in right now and inventiveness in our field is going to be a real uh, a premium I think at this point. Any uh, Mike or Richard would you like to add anything to this form? Well Brian just kind of stole my thunder so I'll <laughs> <laughs> this is a gift having this time to prepare yourself for the future because things will turn around. I mean, who knows what, like we said uncertainty, who knows what it's actually going to be like, you know, a year from now, but there will be auditions, there will be orchestras, and you have to set yourself up to be ready. Uh, so when the time comes, you're ready to just step right in there and, and try and win a job. 
Yes, so it's yep. like the uncertainty in itself is an op is a prime opportunity. Uh, I I believe that uncertainty uh, comes in many guises, in many forms, and I I think young artists we all felt the uncertainty. Of what if I'm not good enough? Or what if there's not the orchestra? Or what if I don't get the scholarship? And so I, I mean this rather. Uh, these are such uncharted waters with this coronavirus, but as you all uh, uh, mentioned, th th there is a life after this. And these young artists um, just have to continue to believe in themselves. Um, I'm very much of the opinion that I didn't choose my profession. I didn't choose to make music. Music chose me. In, in that sense, then I would say that your time will come. It will come a little differently than the past perhaps, but um, if you remain true to yourself and just let yourself continue to be inspired by um, uh, the music that, 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 that you have in order for your voice to be heard in, in a way which is unique, uh, 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 you will prevail. Nobody in this group has demonstrated this more than Richard Brown. I have to say, I've watched him over the 30 years I've known him, and I see him, a project comes up, and he's like, oh, I'll do that. I'll, I'll put the singing uh, rabbis together. I'll put, I'll put this big band together. I mean, uh, he's, That was Cantors, Cantors, the rabbi. Cantors, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're moving into the Spurs section right now already. Our next part will be taking place um, immediately after this. Uh, there were some questions uh, that are quite serious that we were already touching on about the future of music and and i invite the persons who were asking those to please join us i'm sure this topic is something we can keep on talking about and uh probably better with a drink in hand as well i want to thank all of you gentlemen for being here today and, and it's been such a pleasure to hear from all of you and see all of your beautiful faces and just a chance to reconnect and think about uh, the richness of, of, of it all